a good eye out on the preacher to make sure that everything's all right this morning. Well, it is good to see each and every one of you. Will you stand this morning and get your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. That's where we're going to be at this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we will be at. Again, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be able to, to pastor our youth in this church. Um, you know, it's funny, whenever somebody tries to, whenever I try to describe this church, um, you know, we are, we're blessed, Crystal Hill. We're absolutely blessed. Can I get an amen? amen. You want to know why we're blessed? Because every time I try to describe this church, the best way that I can come up with and the best thing that I can say is that this is the friendliest, most loving church, and not only that, but we have the greatest pastor. Amen. I'm not just saying that because he's on the first row. I mean that. I was planning on saying that even before I knew that he was going to be here this morning. Uh, we have the greatest pastor uh, that I believe in this state. Um, so, uh, man, we're blessed, Crystal Hill. We're absolutely blessed. How many of you are at First Corinthians chapter 4 this morning? Amen. Amen. How many of you are probably just going to read it off the screen? <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14 is where I'm going to be at. It says this, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child, in the Lord to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Will you bow your head and just begin to pray with me as we dig into our word this morning. Heavenly Father, you are good and you are gracious. There's no one else besides you. There's no one else other than you, God. Today we come in to, to give you praise, to give you the honor, to give you the glory that you truly deserve, Lord. So I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just begin to move in might and in power within our services. You've already moved in might and in power within these altars, uh, meeting our needs wherever we're at, Lord. And I just pray, God, that, that as you begin to uh, declare your scriptures, God, that you would begin to install this word into our, our hearts, God, so that we can take it outside of these four walls, Lord. I pray, God, that you would begin to anoint me, God, because I'm nothing without you, Lord Jesus. I pray that as I begin to, to, to speak, it would not be my words that are being spoken, but it is your word straight from heaven. Lord Jesus, I need you. These people need you. And I pray that when we walk out of this place, we'll know without a shadow of a doubt that truly we have been in the presence of the Lord. We thank you, Jesus, and we pray all this in your son's glorious and awesome name. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you for doing that. I think it's always good to stand for the reading and the honoring of the word. Um, once again, it's an honor to be here tonight, uh, this morning. Um, if you don't know, this week, uh, most of our students are starting school. And they love it when I say that. They love it when I remind them that they're starting school tomorrow. Uh, they, they usually respond with a nice little groan, um, and that's that's my little nice way of, re of reminding them. Um, so, uh, Pastor honored me with the ability to speak to you this morning, uh, but before I get into this, our teenagers are used to this, um, I usually open up my lessons with a little bit of a game. And I hope that you guys will, you guys have the youth pastor with you this morning, so you're going to have to be okay with this. Uh, uh, can I get all of our teenagers just to come stand up at the front? You guys are going to be my help in this game this morning. Uh, for some of you, you're going to watch your child get embarrassed a little bit. That's going to be great and fantastic. Um, how many of y'all love Oreos? How many of you love Oreos? Maybe that's your favorite snack. Um, and, and if my wife could help me out, well, I probably don't need She just, she just, I know, right? Doesn't she just look pretty? Isn't she the prettiest future? 
Brother Jimmy, you can't get in on this. You gotta sit down. Alright. Awesome. Awesome. Excuse me. Well, um, yeah, before I do in my lessons in youth, we have a little bit of a game. So here's what our students are going to do. I've got some extra school supplies for you guys. Um, some, just some extra stuff that you, you probably already have all that you need. But, you know, it's always good to have a little extra. But in order to get it, here is what you have to do. And maybe you've played this game or maybe you've seen it before. You will have to uh, eat this Oreo. However, however, you cannot use your hands to eat this Oreo. What you have to do is you have to start it from your forehead and you have to move it all the way down your face without touching it. And it has to, it has to go into your mouth without using your hands. If you drop it, pick it back up. Uh, the score's been cleaned. It's fine. You shouldn't get any major disease. Um, shouldn't. You all signed the waiver before you did this, right? No. <laughs> um, if you drop it, that's fine. If it breaks, we have some more. Just grab it. And the first person uh, to eat the Oreo will be declared our winner. Okay? Can't use your hands. It has to start from your forehead all the way down into your mouth. And you guys out in the audience are going to be our judges. Okay? You're going to point out who is our winner. Okay? Do you think you can do that for me? Yeah. All right. All right. Do you think you can do that for me? Give me an amen. Yeah. All right. So you guys go ahead and get it on your foreheads. Get it ready. Get it ready. Probably get your, get your nice little uh, strategy that you're going to go with. Okay? When I say go, you can start. Ready? Get set. Guacamole. Ready, set, go. Google, 
Google. Uh, how many of you use Google pretty regularly? Google's my life source. It's my life saver. If I need to know something, I type it into Google. Google processes over 40,000 searches every second. Every second. That, tr that translates to 3.5 billion searches per day and 1.2 trillion searches per year. It's unbelievable. That we are considered to be in the information age. Information is readily accessible. And because of that, we are also living in an age where people uh, claim to be experts. Notice that I say claim to be experts. Now, y'all can judge me all you want, but I like to, uh, when I'm not, most of the time, I will listen to sports radio. I like sports radio. I like listening to stuff about the Arkansas Razorbacks. <laughs> Most of the time, though, I can't stand to listen to sports radio. I don't know if anybody has noticed this before, but you have uh, Bubba from Lono, who hasn't played football since his high school senior year, but he knows who our starting quarterback should be. He knows how to make our offensive line better, and he knows that he could go out there right now and kick 50-yard field goals better than our current kicker could right now. How many of you know somebody that, that claimed to be an expert in something? I think that everybody has a right to have an opinion. I just don't think everybody has a right to share their opinion. <laughs> Some of you, that may be the biggest thing you have to get all day. Um, <laughs> In our text, Paul is referencing a similar pattern that he's noticing going on at the church of Corinth. At the time that Paul writes this, there is no one in the Corinthian church that has been in the faith more than three years. No one. No one has been in the faith for more than three years. There's a lot of baby Christians. And when I'm talking about baby Christians, I'm not talking about the ones that are in diapers. I'm talking about the ones that complain about the color of the carpet or complain when the worship leader plays a song that they don't like. Uh, these, the, these are baby Christians, people who are not mature in the faith. There's no written Gospels. There's no Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. All they really had was the Apostle Paul. So it was absolutely essential for them to have a model of what a Christian looks like. You know, Paul infamously said, follow me as I follow Christ. I think that should be the marker of a true, mature believer. Well, you, you pulling aside an immature believer, pulling aside somebody new in the faith and say, hey, Follow me as I follow Christ. I think that's 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 our our mark. Uh, Paul says, even though you have countless guides in Christ, your version may say ten thousand instructions. I think King Jimmy says that you may have ten thousand instructors. You don't have very many fathers. Paul makes a clear delineation between being a spiritual guide and being a spiritual father. He makes a clear delineation there. And here's how I see it. What he's talking about here is a guide will tell you what to do, but a father will show you how to do it. A, a, a guide will tell you what to do. A father will also tell you what to do. But not only will they tell you what to do, but they will show you how to do it. Show you how to live. They live the motto, follow me as I follow Christ. And that's what Paul has decided to do for the Corinthian church. And I don't think Paul is, is, some churches get the whole idea of being spiritual fathers way out of whack. And I don't, think, I don't think that's very theologically correct. But I do think that Paul is calling for the church to say, hey, there are some spiritually immature believers for you, that you need to take them aside like a father and show them how to do it. You know, I didn't learn how to hammer a nail uh, just by my father giving me a hammer and some nails. How many of you know that would have ended up pretty bad? <laughs> I probably, I might have lost the thumbnail. Um, but what my dad did is he got, his, he got his nails and he got his hammer and he did it a couple times. And he let me see it and he showed me it. And then he said, hey, son, you try this out as well. I learned it because he showed me. 
And I think the church, this is what the church should do. I think that as, as responsibility on the church, we are to get along some spiritually immature believers and say, hey, I don't want to just tell you how to follow Jesus. I want to show you how to follow Jesus. Because listen, passion cannot be taught. Passion is only caught. Let me say that again. Passion cannot be taught. Passion can only be caught. Passion for the Lord. And you can't teach that. You don't, no matter how many times on a sun, and during Sunday school. And I believe in Sunday school so much. I love Sunday school. It is our main form of, of, of discipleship. But I believe that not only do you tell people, not only do you instruct people, but you show them and say, hey, this is how you live. This is how you follow Jesus. Man, I look around the room and I see so many people that do that with your children and with your grandchildren. And, and you do that with Sunday school and, and you get involved with our children and our, our teenagers. You get alongside of them and you say, hey, let me not just tell you how to do this, but let me show you how to follow Jesus. It's so important. Um, let me tell you why it is important. With this little story about elephants. Um, a park rangers in South, at a South African wildlife preserve were concerned about the fact that 39 rare white rhinos were just ending up dead. They, they couldn't figure out, they, they, they were trying to figure out whether it were, was poachers or perhaps it was uh, some kind of disease that had spread throughout the, the wildlife preserve. And it, they couldn't figure it out. And what they ended up finding out through some research is that what was happening is that they were being killed by adolescent elephants. Let me show you what happened. The story began a decade earlier when the park could no longer sustain the growing population of these elephants. And so what they did is when the smaller elephants grew, uh, were old enough to live without their parents, without an older adult in their life, what they did is they just killed off the parents. Um, what they found, though, was that with no, uh, with no, uh, with no guide, with no mentor around them, these young elephants began to do things that they don't normally do. They began to torture these rhinos. They began to basically become like the neighborhood bullies. Anybody know some neighborhood bullies? A few young males became especially violent uh, and, and crushing the life out of them. The park rangers then came up with an idea. Well, these young adolescent elephants need a mentor in their life. So what they did is they got an older uh, elephant bull and they had him hang out with them. Soon the, the new male established dominance and he began to put the young bulls in their place. The killing stopped and the young males were mentored and they were saved. This tells us why it is so important for us to have somebody there, a spiritual mentor, a spiritual father-like figure who will come along and say, hey, this is what you do and this is why it's important. Let me give you the numbers on why it's so important. The fact is we are living in a world where the latest census tells us that traditional households, traditional households, they, they term it as a mother, a father, and children. That, that's who they term as traditional households. Our census tells us that, that is no longer the majority in America. That, 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 that whole idea of mother, father, that is no longer the majority in America. The, the stats also tell us, and it's on here, 24 million children have no relationship with their biological father. No relationship. 63% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. 90% of homeless runaway children are from fatherless homes. 75% of adolescent teenage patients in chemical abuse centers, rehab, come from fatherless homes. 85% of youths in prison grew up in, you guessed it, fatherless homes. This, these stats are staggering. 
They are astronomical. And I don't tell you this to scare you, but I tell you this to wake us up and say, hey, there are some kids that need some people in their life that will be there, that will tell them, that will love them, and that will give them to Christ. I don't think that we can, as a church, complain about how America is in the toilet and how our young people are in, are in a desolate place. I don't think that we can do that without getting beside them and saying, hey, this is what you do. And I think this falls on us as a church. I, 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 I look around the room and I see so many people that are already doing this, but I think that it's just so important for us to love these kids. For us to love those that don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. To get beside them. To be spiritual mentors. So important. So let me give you three things. Why? Three things why it's so important. The things that we should tell our young people. Why we should raise them up. The first thing that we should teach our young people is the importance of elementary principles. The importance of elementary principles. Um, and, and I've always learned it like this. We need to teach them how to pray. And we need to teach them how to pray. You know, I always found it interesting when the disciples would ask Jesus how to questions. They didn't ask him uh, how to cast demons out. You know, Pastor, if, if I was hanging out with Jesus, I would have been like, uh, Jesus, how do you preach like you do? You know, how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how, do, you do, how do you do that? Um, no, every time that Jesus got his disciples uh, aside, they would ask him, Jesus, how do you pray? And I think that's so crucial in today's time. We have to come alongside and we have to teach them how to pray. Let me tell you what Leonard Gravenhill said. This was, I love this quote. He says that no man is greater than his private, than his private prayer life. Fail here and we fail everywhere. Fail in your constant daily prayer life. And if we fail there, then we fail everywhere. You know, the next generation has to have a model on how to pray. And that may mean us stepping up and saying, hey, I want to, I want to get aside with you. I'll, I'll pray out loud with you there. Or I'll teach you how to pray. I want to show you. And more than anything, that is modeling a private prayer life. Each and every one of our young people. Not just telling them to do it, but showing them how to do it. Not only do we model a life of prayer, but we model a life of Bible reading. D.L. Moody said this, Sin will keep you from the book, or the book will keep you from sin. The book will keep, sin will keep you from the book, or the book will keep you from sin. Really, it's up to us. You know, I always heard that, uh, the, the, the best sign of, of a life together is a Bible that is falling apart. You ever, you ever heard that phrase before? A sign of a, of a life that is together is, a, is somebody who has a Bible that's falling apart. Because they read that thing so much because they just want to dig into the Word of God. And they want to see what the Word of God has to say. And they, they have a passion for the Word of God. And they love the Word of God. And they just want people to know about Jesus. You know, I, I think that um, Bible reading, Bible is what our, this younger generation misses. Um, I, I feel like more teenagers know lyrics to Christian songs more than they do know Bible verses. You know, they know the lyrics to Christian songs more than they know they memorize Bible verses. And I love the fact that our students know good Christian music, but that cannot substitute the words of God. It cannot substitute this book. We have to live by it. We have to, we have to give our life to it. And we have to show our students, hey, this is how you keep your life on track. If you follow the words of this book, you will, you will stay on the straight and narrow. You, you will find your way if you stay with the book. We teach them prayer. We teach them to read the Bible. Not only that, but we show them how to live on a solid foundation. Um, we, we are in an overproduced and overworked society where, where people work 40 to 60 hours a week. They keep on going to one thing after another. And, and, and our kids are picking up on this, too. 
the best way to, to, to have a life on a solid foundation is to have Jesus first and everything else second after that. You know, I always tell our students that if Jesus isn't Lord over all, he's not Lord at all. He's got to have every part of your life. He, he has to take root. He has to be Lord over every part. He can't just have a little slice. It can't just be something small. It, Jesus has to be every part of your life. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 11, Paul says this, According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let everyone take care of how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that there is no other foundation that can, that can hold, that can be solid like Jesus Christ. How many of you have the solid foundation of Jesus Christ? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. To have a solid foundation. We pass that on to the kids. We pass the idea of having, hey, Jesus is first. Everything else comes second. Nothing else matters like Jesus. We get our, we get our priorities all mixed up and all jammed up. Hey, Jesus is first. When life gets complicated, and it does, troubles happen and things happen. But you just say, hey, Jesus is still first. Jesus still is first, and he's Lord overall. Number three, I think it's the most important. The things that we share to our young people is we have to show them how to live a spirit-filled life. We have to show them how to live a spirit filled. We, we, have to, we have to show them what it's like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just speaking in tongues. I love to speak in tongues. And not just prophesying. I love when somebody prophesies. But we live the fruit of the Spirit. We live as God has called us to live. Listen, we're living in a broken world. And it's not getting any better. But I promise you that the way that the church can combat that is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Be, being full of it. And in going into our workplaces, going into our schools, young people, and living it out fully. And making people know without a shadow of doubt. And then they look at you and they say, hey, there's something different about you. And, and you can just tell when somebody has Jesus all over them. You can just tell. And then there's having Jesus being spirit-filled. We all know the scripture, Galatians 5, 16 through 25 says this, but I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his, passion, with his passions and desires. I love verse 25. It says this. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Hmm. You know, I could have all the tongues in the world. I could prophesy to every young people in the world that I see. I can pray the most eloquent prayer. I could preach an impactful sermon, the likes of somebody on TV, but if I don't have the fruit of the Spirit behind it, I'm useless to model anything to the younger generation. If I don't have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, if I don't live a Spirit-filled life, if our young people are not shown how to live Spirit-filled lives, who's going to teach them that? How are they going to carry it on to the next generation? 
Church, we, we, we have to not only tell them, hey, this is how you live, but we get alongside them and we show you the pain. Come, come on alongside here. Come, come here. Read your Bible every day. Be in prayer every day. Follow the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. You know, I love what um, I love what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon says, "Let us not carve our names on stone, but let's carve our name on hearts." You know, I think the best testimony that somebody could say about this church is not necessarily that we have the best pastor, and we do. The best testimony that somebody could say that about this church is is not necessarily, well, I got saved at an event here. Or I, I saw something about this church. I, I've been in this church my whole life. I don't think that that necessarily is a testimony. I think the best testimony that somebody can say about this church is if a young person gets to heaven and they begin to tell the story of how they got saved and, and what happened, how, how they ended up going to church. And they say, well, I remember so-and-so from Crystal Hill Assembly of God. They loved me. They got alongside of me. They didn't just tell me what to do, but they showed me how to live my life. They showed me how to follow Jesus with all my heart, with all my soul. I think that is the greatest testimony that somebody can say about this church. By the grace of God, I hope that we can become it. By the grace of God, I think there are some men and I think there are some women here today that will get alongside some students and will love them and will say, hey, no, this is not just what you do. This is how you do it. So here's what I want to do. If you, if you will go ahead and stand this morning all, all over this place. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we need you. God, I pray for each and every one of these, your people. Oh, I thank you for their service. I thank you for their faithfulness. I thank you that you are good and you are great. But Lord, I pray that this, this word wouldn't just be something that we hear, Lord, but it would be something that we live by. 2 Corinthians 3, 2 through 3 says, you yourselves are a letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts.